seven or eight months after Five Forks when Lee saw that it was time to try to move out of the Petersburg entrenchments and try to get back in touch hopefully by moving south and west and try to get in touch with troops under Joseph Johnston the retreat to Appomattox would begin uh, once again no food constant moving constant trying to get away from a, a force that was superior in manpower and horse flesh and had food had advantage um, eventually of course at Appomattox uh, Lee is going to be forced to surrender his army is pretty much surrounded and as that uh, occurs approximately 120 men from the 26th North Carolina would surrender now I think one time we talked about this do we have a number of how many men might have gone through the entire war? About 2,000. No, I mean, it surrendered at Appomattox. Oh, surrendered at Appomattox. Yeah. A handful, maybe? I don't know. It's something, uh, something for you to do, Skip. You don't have anything else to do. <laughs> but um, I always think about, you know, even if there was just one, what he would have seen. 2,000 men come and gone. Um, friends and friends of friends and family and neighbors and there's 120 of you left at Appomattox to try to get home from there now that kind of brings the 26 back to many other regiments that would have gone through some of the same kind of thing trying to struggle through the war trying to fight through the fights trying to get home once it was over so they start out with a lot of common a lot in common and they end up with a lot in common but every regiment is going to have its own story. And the 26th has got a great one. Thank you. I need to introduce Doug here. This is Doug Davis. Uh, he is from uh, Caldwell County. Doug's been a member of the 26th since 1988 as a young boy at that point in time. Made his mother come out uh, to everything that we were at locally. And, one day we're getting and we sure enough did it. Uh, I think the first was the 125th Gettysburg. Yeah, right, yep. So we, we got a quite quite a big baptism of fire at that point. Uh, before Doug plays again for us, we've got what well, the museum does. Our regiment publishes a historical magazine called Company Front. And it has been published since 1989. Uh, and it is nothing but historical uh, letters, diaries, or original uh, articles prepared by people that you're not going to find this stuff anywhere else. The museum has bought copies from us to sell here. If you're really interested in the 26th North Carolina, and particularly Company F, Five Right and Guards, there's two sets of letters back here that's been transcribed. One is called the Courtney Letters, and the other is the most recent edition, the Setzer Letters. Uh, everybody mentioned in these letters has a little biographical uh, notes on them. Uh, a lot of the family connections that Randall was alluding to. Um, the, the Gettysburg letters from Tom Setzer are some of the best that you've ever seen. He talks about the fighting on the first day, and then he talks about Bristow Station. And uh, the 26th, that Company F lost 91 men at Gettysburg. All 91 killed or wounded. Now some of them were slightly wounded. By October, three or four months later, they're back into the ranks of the 26th at Bristow Station in October of 63. Tom writes home how lonely it is. And he's talking about the people he grew up with. And, and the Company F was heavy from Lenore and what we know as the Gamble, we know as the Gamble community now, and up to the Johns River. Company F was heavily uh, pulled from those areas. And he talks about how lonely it is. Now 32 of the 34 in Company F are wounded or killed at Bristow Station. Again, that company is decimated. But Tom's worrying about when will his time come. So I encourage you, if you're interested in High Brighton Guards, talk to uh, Colin. Grab the magazines. Uh, the letters are priceless. They're priceless. So, 
Okay, we need to reset again and let Doug play another right. team for us here. Play with him and slide. I'm gonna move. I'm gonna move. Stop. See if I can play a little bit of the Bonnie Blue Flag, which is a patriotic song in the beginning of the war. Okay, our uh, next talk is going to be a quick study of the photographs of uh, Caldwell County soldiers in uniforms. I'll briefly give you a little, uh, a little bio on each one as they come up. First is William T.R. Abernathy, enlisted in the Rough and Ready Guards, April of 1861. He was killed at Fraser's Farm, June 30, 1862. William Henry Harrison Anderson, Company K of the 42nd North Carolina. Uh, nothing really uh, as far as the wounds or anything happened to him during the war. Company K mostly did a lot of patrol and guard duty. Uh, the most famous Company K 42nd North Carolina uh, soldier would, been ha would be Tom Dooley. Same company as uh, Anderson here. Joseph R. Ballou, second captain of High Brighton Guards. He was uh, elected captain after the Battle of New Bern when Rankin, the first captain, was moved up to major. He resigned in October of 62 due to ill health. He later on uh, went into the Home Guard and uh, worked with uh, William Deal. Davis W. Barber, Company F, 26 North Carolina. Again, he had no significant wounds that's in his records. He did survive the war. Um, he had two brothers that also were in Company F of the 26, so it was a family affair, as Randall's alluded to a minute ago. This picture has baffled us for over 20 years. He looks like an officer in this picture. Davis W. Barber stayed as a private throughout the war, so we're kind of speculating that he had a, a photographer's prop or something going on here. 
William Rufus Barlow. We have the William Rufus Barlow letters here available at the museum. He was conscripted into company and put into Company B of the 18th North Carolina. He, and along with about 170 men from Caldwell, Wilkes, and Alexander and Catawba County were conscripted in August and September of 1862, sent to Camp Hill, or Fort Hill, that's Camp Hill, correct? In Statesville, Camp Hill in Statesville. And they were placed in companies A, B, and C of the 18th North Carolina. They were, did not have the chance to go with the Caldwell County uh, Regiment. Uh, William Rufus Barlow, his letters are tremendous. It shows the perspective of a married man uh, and having to leave his home. Uh, sadly, he dies at, at Elmira Prison Camp in June, January of 1865. Pickens Barlow, one of the numerous bar members of the Barlow family from Caldwell and Wilkes County that fought. Pickens was in the Rough and Ready Boys in April of 1861. He was wounded at Seven Pines, Fredericksburg, and wounded and captured at Gettysburg. He keeps coming back, and he ends up surrendering at Appomattox Courthouse. He had a brother, also in Company I of the 26, named Calvin. Sergeant James Barnes, one of the more recently discovered photographs that uh, we have out there. He was Company I of the 26. He was wounded at Gettysburg July 1. He did come back and he uh, surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse. He also had a brother that served George Washington Barnes. He was Company A of the 22nd, the Rough and Ready Guards. Now, I guess no story would be, uh, would be uh, complete without talking about the Blaylocks. This is Melinda Pritchard Blaylock, who was married to Keith Blaylock, this gentleman here. They both enlisted on March the 20th, 1862, this was that first conscription act that had come in. Keith's sole intention was to get to the Union Army. He could not get to him from here over into East Tennessee. He thought, I can get to him in Eastern North Carolina. Notice that the date that they enlisted is six days after New Bern. They did not fight in the Bible, okay? They, when they joined up with the regiment, they were in Kinston, 30 miles west of New Bern. They were discharged one month later, April the 20th, 1862. And Melinda went in disguised as Sam, the brother of Keith Blaylock. Keith decided he saw, and Saul realized that he could not get to the Union Army to cross over the lines, so he rolls himself around in poison sumac, develops a severe rash all over the body, and gets discharged, surgeon doesn't know what's going on. Well, this is when Melinda comes up. She uh, identifies herself as Melinda instead of Sam to Colonel Vance, and she too is discharged. They both return home to Northern Caldwell County up on the slopes of the Grandfather Mountain and basically bring a war of terror in the Globe Valley. Uh, Keith actually joins the 10th Michigan Cavalry in 1864. Uh, he kind of is an independent though, he is on their muster rolls, but he serves as an independent scout and a mountain guide to people trying to cut across over in the Knoxville area of, of uh, East Tennessee. He also uh, befriends George W. Kirk, and Blaylock and Kirk are up in Blowing Rock at the, uh, behind Stoneman's Calvary Column as it moves through. They, they. Uh, basically hold blowing rock open in case Stoneman needs it. Nero Guy Bradford, Company I-26. He was wounded and captured at Gettysburg and probably his claim to fame is he was one of the immortal 600, which was the 600 Confederate officers that were used as human shields in Charleston by the Federal Army. Uh, he somehow survives all this and gets discharged in June of 65. Jones Irvin Bradshaw, wounded and captured at Gettysburg, surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse. Jacob Anderson Bush, Company I, 26 North Carolina. Uh, in this photograph, you see Jacob in a 1861 North Carolina regulation sack coat. We, Caleb had talked about that earlier. 
Jacob was wounded at four wounds at Gettysburg and captured, left on the field on the July 3rd charge. Comes back, he's wounded on August 25th, 64, at the Battle of Ream Station near Petersburg. He returns again and then surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse. Joseph Bogle Clark, Company A, 22nd North Carolina. He was part of the Rough and Ready Guards of the original enlistment on April 30, 1861. He was wounded at Gettysburg. He had uh, five brothers that fought in this war. Drury Coffey, he became Sergeant Major of the 58th North Carolina, but before that he enlisted in Company E of the 58th, wounded at Chickamauga, Rocky Face Ridge, and captured at McDonough, Georgia. Another of the Coffees, Henry Clay Coffey, Company F of the 26th, High Brighton Guards, wounded and captured at Gettysburg. He is the brother of Thomas Jefferson Coffey, who you'll see in just a few minutes. Smith Webb Coffey. He had moved to Cherokee, North Carolina, western part of the state, and enlisted in the Cherokee Rangers. He is from Caldwell County, though. Thomas J. Coffey. Thomas Jefferson Coffey was the brother of Henry Clay. He was living in uh, eastern Tennessee, right across from Boone and Watauga County, over in Carter County, I believe it was, as a merchant. Came home, enlisted in Company E of the 58th North Carolina. Uh, he mostly served throughout the war as a quartermaster for that regiment. Now, back to the coffees, one last thing. From my records and stuff, there was approximately 41 or 42 members of the coffee family that fought in the war from Caldwell County, so they easily outdistance every other family. Andrew Hall Courtney, this is uh, the writer of the letters that we have back there. Andrew enlisted in Company F of the 26 High Brighton Guards. He enlisted in early 62. His younger brother, Henry Clay Courtney, as you see here, enlisted when it was, uh, the High Brighton Guards was formed in, on July 15, 1861. Andrew lost a leg at Gettysburg, uh, was retired from service and came home. Henry Clay Courtney was mortally wounded at Gettysburg and died a few months later. Mike Krieger, actually a Burke County boy, but he's in my picture collection because he married a Courtney. One of the girls here from Caldwell County. He was Company A of the 22nd, so he did join the Caldwell Rough and Ready Guards. Wounded at Seven Pines, mortally wounded in 1864 around Richmond in June of that year. And then we come to the Deal family. You have William Deal III and William Deal IV. William Deal III was the North Carolina Home Guard commander. Uh, his son, William Deal IV, was a sickly person, is what I've read, and not able to withstand the rigors of, uh, of, of line company service. But he was a tanner and he worked in Salisbury, which was a big military depot. And uh, so he did that for the service of the uh, North Carolina. Another son of William Deal III was Avery Jerome Deal, Company A of the 26th, wounded at Wilderness, but did surrender at Appomattox. Marcus Deal, Company A of the 22nd, wounded and captured at Gettysburg, wounded at North Anna, and he surrendered at Appomattox. Pinckneyville, another Company A, 22nd. You can see all these first, first enlistments here, guys. Uh, Pinckney Deal was wounded at Shepherdstown following the retreat uh, from Sharpsburg. Rufus Deal started out with Company A of the 22nd, was wounded at Seven Pines in Fredericksburg, transferred to Company I of the 26th as a third lieutenant in January of 64, and he was killed in action at Cold Harbor June 2nd, 1864. And yet another brother of these Deal boys here. The last one was Sidney Deal from Caldwell County, but at the time the war started was the sheriff of Watauga County. And he joined Company D, which was the Watauga Rangers, which became uh, Company D of the uh, First North Carolina uh, Cavalry. Uh, his big claim to fame during the war was he got captured during Stoneman's raid on furlough here in Lenore. And uh, great story how he helped A.C. Avery, who you had mentioned in your talk, Jeff, 
how he helped disguise him from some of the local uh, unionists that were trying to find Avery because Avery did not uh, uh, have uh, wasn't standing in good light with a lot of them. They were wanting for pay, looking for payback. So Dill, uh, with the help of his sister and her family, uh, put him in new clothes, different set of clothes, shaved beard, and, and uh, basically successfully disguised A.C. Avery uh, on the march to Camp Chase, Ohio. The next is uh, William Wallace Dixon, Company A of the Second, uh, I'm sorry, 22nd North Carolina. He was wounded at Gettysburg. Major G.W.F. Harper, wounded at Rosaka, Georgia. And then he actually commanded the 58th North Carolina at Bentonville and was over the surrender uh, and named Major, ironically enough, on April the 9th, 1865, which was, of course, Lee's surrender date. He had a younger brother, Samuel Finley Harper, in Company A of the 22nd. Uh, one of the other new pictures that we've come up with is Abner Burge Hayes, Company F. He uh, was mortally wounded at Bristow Station in October of 63. John B. Holloway, Company F. He had two brothers also in Company F. He was killed the first day of Gettysburg. An extremely tall man from the reading, six foot four, so he kind of stood out a little bit, but uh, that's a classic image right there. Part of the cousins of the Holloway and the Hoods, and this is George Washington Hood, wounded at Malvern Hill, one year later wounded at Gettysburg, then mortally wounded at Bristow Station three months later. The Hoods and the Holloways were first cousins. John Thomas Jones. He enlisted in the Orange Light Infantry, 1st North Carolina uh, Volunteers, became Company D while he was a student at the University of North Carolina. He transferred to Company I of the 26th North Carolina as a second lieutenant in sept um, yeah, September of 1862. He actually commanded the regiment on the second day's fight for the regiment, which would have been July 3 at Gettysburg. Wounded both days slightly at Gettysburg, killed in action at Wilderness in May of 64. He had two other brothers that fought in the war, and this was one of them, Walter Lenore Jones, who started out with Company A of the 22nd. You can see the hat brass. Uh, he transferred once his brother had come into Company I of the 26th. Walter transferred over. He was mortally wounded at Gettysburg. Francis Mary McCrary became first sergeant of Company I later on in the war. Part of the Miller clan here. You talked about uh, Nelson Miller, Company B of Avery's battalion. This is a younger brother, Elijah Hamilton Miller. He went across the Burke County line and joined the Burke Dragoons, uh, which became Company F of the 3rd Regiment North Carolina Cavalry. And he, along with one, two, three, five other brothers, all Millers, fought in the war. They're buried over at Mary's Grove, right out on the west side of town. This uh, gentleman here is one of his brothers, John Starks Ravenscroft Miller. One of the most interesting stories that you're going to find about a North Carolina soldier. He was pre-war U.S. Army. Enlisted in 1857 in the 4th U.S. Volunteers, I'm sorry, U.S. Infantry. Transferred to the 2nd U.S. Dragoons. He was named Sergeant Major of that regiment right before North Carolina seceded from the Union. He resigned his commission in the U.S. Army, came home to North Carolina. Uh, the state of North Carolina, Adjutant General's Office, realized what they had when he walked in, and he was placed as adjutant of the 1st North Carolina State Troops. And he eventually became uh, company commander, Company A, to that same regiment and was mortally wounded, I'm sorry, killed two weeks before Gettysburg in Winchester on uh, June the 15th. You can see his pre-war picture on your left and a picture from Clark's Histories on the right. James Daniel Moore. This is the gentleman that took in the Blaylocks, young boy. Wounded at Gettysburg, he, did, he was wounded so bad in the leg that he could not walk and transferred to Company D of the 1st North Carolina Cavalry after Gettysburg. Uh, it was his father, Carol Moore, 
uh, that the Blaylocks went after a couple times in 64 and 65. Cyan Oxford, ensign, meaning color bear, wounded at Seven Pines, uh, promoted to ensign in April of 64, wounded at Wilderness, carrying the colors of the 22nd North Carolina. Had one brother, James, that was Company I of the 26. Simeon Filial is the tw one of the twins. Gideon was his twin brother. Simeon is credited with starting the fight, according to historian Rod Gregg, at, of the 26 at Gettysburg. As they were on Hare Ridge, he's the one that bolted to the front, screaming and hollering and firing the first shot of the 26 at that battle on July 1. George L. Powell, can you go, Ben? Enlisted Company F, 26, High Brighton Guards, mortally wounded at the Wilderness, died on May the 12th, 1864. He had three other brothers, Thomas Monroe, Company A, 22nd, William Powell, Company A, 22nd, and Pinckney, Company F, 26th, that also served during the war. First captain of the 26th North Carolina, Company F, was N.P. Rankin, Nathaniel Patterson Rankin. He was the headmaster of Finley Academy, which was the boys' school over where Bellevue Cemetery is at now. He raised the High Brighton Guards and, and had a big ceremony on the square, July 15, 1861. Marched off with them, fought at the Battle of New Bern, promoted to major following New Bern, but he resigned because of ill health. He later on joined the 65th North Carolina, which was the 5th North Carolina Cavalry. 5th Cavalry. Okay. Charles McDowell Sudreth, Company F 26, wounded at Gettysburg, but resigned due to the wounds. He too, like Sidney Dill, was home in Lenore when Stoneman's people come through, and he got captured. He, along with Sidney Deal, helped take care of uh, disguising A.C. Avery. He had five brothers that fought in the war. Jeff, you recognize this young man here? Yeah. Benjamin L. Taylor, Company F, 26. This is Jeff's ancestor. Wounded at Gettysburg and captured at Spotsylvania Courthouse. Had a brother, Robert, that was also Company F, 26. We're coming into part of the Tuttle family. This is Marcus Gamewell Tuttle, younger, younger brother of William and John. He joined a 8th Battalion, North Carolina Junior Reserves, and which became Company C, I'm sorry, yeah, Company C of the 3rd Regiment. Uh, he was captured at Fort Fisher, Christmas Day, 1864. Confined to Point Lookout Prison, come home, never really recovered from the disease and sickness that he acquired in prison, died five years later as a young man. He had become a minister during that time. And the town of Gamewell is named after this young boy here. One of his brothers was John A. Tuttle, Company F, 26. He was not at Gettysburg. We found through letters that he was uh, in the hospital in Lynchburg, Virginia, sick. He uh, did, though, come back to the regiment a few months later, was mortally wounded at Bristow Station, killed with, by a bayonet. And we looked at the bayonets earlier in the uniform talks. Uh, Romulus Morrison Tuttle, this is coming from Clark's regiments. Uh, he was the third and final captain of Company F, 26 North Carolina. Wounded at Gettysburg, wounded at Wilderness, wounded at Petersburg in the summer of 64, wounded at John's Farm in September 64, and retired to the Invalid Corps late March 1865. And then finally the last Tuttle is William A. Tuttle, Company A of the 22nd. If you'll notice there's something in the picture on the left, that is a lock of hair that was in the Ambro type case uh, and sadly enough it's kind of rubbed off the uh, picture uh, from the glass plate. But William Tuttle wounded at 2nd Manassas. He actually told in a letter home in the Setzer letters, you'll find them, he talked about he was actually in command of the regiment on the retreat from the third day's charge 
and he was laughing about it, making fun of himself. Who would have thought Bill Tuttle would have been in command of a regiment? He did survive the war, surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse. So, any questions? Okay, that's it. Come up. Got another one? No, yes? No, all right. We're going, we're going to go on with Collet Leventhorpe then. It's all right there. I'll keep up with you on the slides. All right, because I ain't paying no attention to what's going That's on behind. I'm hanging here with Randall. <laughs> yeah, go yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeff is going to do a talk uh, for us about Collet Leavenworth. This is a uh, Confederate veteran who uh, truly a fascinating man. Uh, little has been known, written about him, until uh, about four years ago when uh, a couple of Greensboro, North Carolina historians uh, published a biography on him. Uh, Caldwell County's only Confederate general. So I'm here in spirit representing him today, I guess. I joke to people sometimes that uh, uh, before Call at Leavenport come along, I'm the only Confederate general in Caldwell County. <laughs> but anyhow, what, what, uh, distinguishes him from many notable and gallant Caldwell County veterans that Skip and others have talked about here today is that Leventhorpe was an Englishman. He was born in England on May 15, 1815 in Exmouth. He was born to a, if not wealthy, but prosperous uh, parentage there. His father uh, ran a stationary business in London. His uh, mother had some claim to the English aristocracy. She had had an ancestor who had been a, uh, a baron. Uh, sadly, uh, Collett's mother dies within four months of his birth. And his father passes away within five years of his birth. And he and his two other siblings uh, embark upon a journey of living with grandparents until they too die. And then on to aunts and uncles. And, uh, had pretty much of an orphaned existence as young people. Fortunately, uh, the family, as I pointed out, was prosperous enough that uh, uh, Collett's education was a good, sound one. He uh, was accepted into Winchester College in England, which was a pres uh, prestigious school at that time, still is, I do believe. Um, he got into some trouble there. Uh, there were some allegations of um, theft and maybe a little drinking, uh, he was forced to withdraw and he completed his education under the tutelage of uh, private instructors, uh, but achieved the equivalent of a, a sound college education. He uh, finally, after flailing around a bit about what he would do uh, for a living, he determined uh, that he'd like to be a soldier. The British Army at that time uh, had two routes to becoming an officer in the English Army. Uh, one was to go to the, their equivalent of West Point, which is Sandhurst College, and obtain a commission. Or, if your family was wealthy enough, you could purchase an officer's commission for money. Uh, and 
Collis case, his family was able to purchase him a uh, commission as an ensign in the 14th Regiment of Foot. Uh, now this was in the, uh, by this time, the mid, early 1830s, and uh, uh, the English Empire spanned the world at that time. Uh, fortunately, I suppose for Collett, uh, <clears throat> they weren't involved in any active wars at the time of any significance at, at any rate. And his service uh, in the West Indies uh, and in Canada was uh, largely uneventful, but um, he apparently did acquire quite a bit of knowledge on the duties and character of being a soldier and an officer. Uh, by, uh, oh, I got up there, where are you at? Okay. By, by 1843, he sold his commission as a, a British Army officer and decides to come to the United States. And he, he embarks upon a tendency that remains with him for the rest of his life to uh, get involved in what we would call now, I guess, get-rich-quick schemes, uh, mainly gold mining operations, which largely failed him in every instance that he was involved in, but uh, when he came to uh, America and entered the port of Charleston, uh, through his family connections, he was able to obtain employment as a repres an investment representative for a banking concern in Charleston. And they sent him to uh, Western North Carolina, uh, which at that time, uh, was having the, the first gold rush of United States history with the Reed Gold Mine down at Cabarrus County. And it was thought uh, that uh, there were other gold mining possibilities throughout the western part of the state. So Leventhorpe was sent up here to, to look into uh, potential gold mining operations that the bank could invest and hopefully make money in. Uh, he. Uh, first went to Rutherford County, North Carolina, and, and while he was there, uh, he would uh, get to know rather intimately the Bryan family of that county, and would meet what would become his wife, Louisa Bryan. Uh, they uh, uh, evidently, a uh, uh, love relationship flowered between the two of them, one of her sisters had uh, married into the Patterson family here in Caldwell County, and uh, Collett and Louisa were frequent visitors with the Patterson and the Jones family up in Happy Valley, and uh, apparently uh, fell greatly in love with this area. Uh, in fact, uh, Mildred McDowell Jones, uh, late grand lady of this county uh, often told me the story of how Collett and Louisa came to uh, have a picnic atop High Bright Mountain and became secretly engaged. Uh, well, apparently the secret didn't last too long because when uh, Louisa's father, who was an old crusty militia general down in Rutherford County, found out about it, he objected quite vociferously because he just wasn't too impressed apparently with young Eleventh Orp, primarily uh, his lack of uh, financial uh, wherewithal, um, being a representative of a bank and not finding much prospects in the gold mining operations in western North Carolina, so he, he prevented the marriage. Uh, it's often the case with young people uh, parental consent is no bar to romance and love, and uh, the relationship continued to flourish. And uh, to placate his future father-in-law, Collett decided that uh, he would enter into the profession of medicine, and went back to Charleston, South Carolina, and studied at the South Carolina Medical College. Back in that time, you could uh, go through a course of instruction in two years to become a physician. 
and he apparently applied himself quite well, came out ahead of his class with honors, and became a doctor. Oddly enough, however, he never practiced medicine a day in his life. Uh, the 1860 uh, uh, census lists his occupation as physician. Uh, in correspondence from the period, he's often referred to and refers himself as a doctor, but he never practices medicine for whatever reason, which has eluded uh, historians so far, anyhow. But his old uh, occupation of being a soldier would certainly come back into use very quickly when the war loomed in 1860-61 here in North Carolina. And uh, apparently he offered his services as captain of the first company being raised in Rutherford County for the war. Uh, However, being an Englishman and sort of an outsider, uh, he was passed over and a man by the name of Champion Davis uh, actually became the captain of that company and later the colonel of the 16th North Carolina, killed in action during the seven days fighting around Richmond. Uh, that did not deter Colin Leventhorpe, however, and um, a new regiment was being formed in the uh, fall of uh, 1862, uh, which included four ca uh, companies from Rutherford County, the uh, 34th North Carolina. It was being uh, organized and trained down at the nearest camp of instruction at that time near High Point, North Carolina. And given the fact that there were a goodly number of Rutherford County natives in those companies who were, of course, acquainted with Leventhorpe, uh, they prevailed in uh, electing him as the colonel of the 34th North Carolina. And he served as such for a little less than a year, I guess it was. Uh, the regiment was formed and organized at High Point. It got sent to the northeastern part of North Carolina where it was involved in defending uh, various positions down there. Uh, Leventhorpe is credited with making the recommendation for the placement of Fort Branch on the uh, Roanoke River, which would later prove to be a very prominent defensive fixture in northeastern North Carolina, much coveted by the Union Army and Navy. Uh, at any rate, uh, in the interim, the early units in North Carolina, the volunteer regiments of which there were 14, the first North Carolina volunteers, which uh, was referred to as the Bethel Regiment because they fought at the first land battle of the war at Bethel, Virginia, their term of service was for six months. So their term had expired, and these 14 volunteer regiments were later reorganized as North Carolina troops uh, by having 10 added to their number. So therefore, the first North Carolina volunteers would now become the 11th Regiment North Carolina troops. And it still retained uh, a goodly number of uh, men who had served in the old 1st North Carolina Volunteers. And arguably that unit was, in the first year or two of the war, the most celebrated unit from North Carolina. Uh, it also contained, uh, in, in its ranks, uh, Henry Wyatt, who was the first Confederate soldier killed in a land battle during the war. Uh, but at any rate, the officers and uh, men of the newly reorganized 11th North Carolina uh, had heard a lot about Call at Leventhorpe and uh, apparently were impressed, particularly in his abilities of organizing and drilling troops and his uh, initiative and activity in the eastern part of the state during the first year of the war. And Leventhorpe was elected as colonel of the 11th North Carolina in, in March of that year. Uh, and served as such 
until he was uh, severely wounded on the first day of Gettysburg on July 1st, 1863, when he received a pretty severe wound to his left forearm and also a lesser wound to his left hip, which uh, made him unfit for uh, service afterwards. He was uh, actually captured on the retreat from Gettysburg uh, and served um, uh, about four or five months in the United States military prisons in Maryland before he was released and uh, came home. Uh, home by then was still in Rutherford County, but while he was there recuperating, uh, he engaged in a correspondence with uh, the governor of the state, Zebulon Vance, and uh, indicated to Governor Vance that he hoped that he was not so disabled that he could not be of continued service to his adopted state. And uh, Vance uh, did not have the power to make him a Confederate general per se, because that had to come from the Confederate Congress and President Davis, but he did have the power to appoint general officers of the militia and the Home Guard. So as I had discussed with you folks previously, the Home Guard created in the summer of 1862. Uh, by uh, 1864, the Home Guard would be divided into two brigades in North Carolina. The first brigade essentially covering the Home Guard battalions in the western half of the state, and the second brigade of the Home Guard comprised of the counties in the eastern part of the state not occupied by Union troops. Um, oddly enough, given call it Leventhorpe's affiliation with western North Carolina, he was given command of the second brigade of the Home Guard, which was the eastern component of the Home Guard, and established his headquarters at Goldsboro. Uh, Leventhorpe uh, called a great deal of uh, flack, I guess would be a good word to use in the press, during his tenure as commander of the Home Guard down in the eastern part of the state. Again, these are the men who are being charged with hunting down deserters, enforcing the conscription acts, uh, which were certainly not popular um, uh, movements amongst the public, in which uh, uh, Leventhorpe was apparently pretty zealous in trying to enforce. So uh, he, he gained some enmity from some of his actions while he was commander of the Home Guard down east. But nonetheless, uh, he stuck at it to the very end. Uh, he took his parole with General Johnston's army, which was then at Greensboro, North Carolina, on May 7th, 1865, almost, not quite a month after Lee had surrendered, before he gave it up. Uh, Leventhorpe's uh, post-war moved here to Caldwell County uh, and eventually uh, built a home in Happy Valley known as Holly Lodge. It's uh, gone now. It, it, it burned in the, I believe, late 1870s. You might be a little more up on that. Uh, apparently it was a, a, a beautiful home built at great expense. Uh, it was just across the road from his sister-in-law who lived at Walnut Fountain, which still stands, and as I understand, is up for sale, in fact, right now. But um, Leventhorpe uh, continued to engage in any number of business schemes post-war, mining operations again. He uh, got involved in um, the inventions of some farm machinery. He's actually got a patent on a corn husking machine that uh, he and uh, a team of uh, other folks produced. And uh, generally led a uh, pretty quiet and respectable life. The people of Caldwell County uh, uh, thought well of it. They uh, ran in the 1870s for the Office of State Auditor in North Carolina. Uh, another 
position and occupation is kind of baffling given his background, but uh, uh, he failed in that election because uh, he was uh, greatly criticized by the carpetbagger government in charge of the state at that time for his Confederate service during the war. And uh, he apparently, while he lived here in Caldwell County, became quite a collector of rare and fine art, paintings primarily, and had apparently accumulated a, a great collection of which nobody knows what has happened to. The Leventhorpes did not produce any children. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, some of his effects, have you got that slide with the coat? Yeah, you already did. You saw a coat that belonged to uh, Leventhorpe while he was colonel of either or both the 34th and the 11th North Carolina. And that coat was donated by his wife, apparently, from the records that I looked at state archives. Uh, but he uh, just never seemed to have long-term financial success in his life. It was one struggle after another, seemingly, for him. Um, however, the, he and his wife, uh, were self-sustaining enough financially that they, in general, lived a fairly comfortable life up in Happy Valley. Uh, one of the last uh, great efforts of Collett Leventhorpe's uh, existence on this weary world uh, was helping in designing and the building of the Chapel of Rest up in Happy Valley, which uh, ultimately would be where he would be laid to rest. Uh, less than a year um, after it uh, was built out there in 1879. Um, again, uh, just, just not your typical association with Caldwell County, an Englishman, a foreigner by birth who uh, comes to this uh, area and falls in love becomes a great admirer of the beauty of Caldwell County and Happy Valley. Apparently was a great uh, a, uh, hunter, liked to hunt deer and large game up in the valley around Buffalo Cove and served his uh, state well mm -hmm. and true. And I think in summing up, um, I'd just like to point out uh, that uh, <coughs> The, the men that we've had the privilege of talking about here today, the various speakers who, who, who've had a chance to speak, uh, have the privilege of trying to carry on the tradition of probably one of the most remarkable generations this country has ever seen. I would like to think that there are enough good, true hearts that there will be young generations in the future who will meet that I can never imagine them exceeding the generation of North Carolinians that serve. Thanks for your time and patience. Good to have you here. Did they happen to name Collettsville after this man? Uh, no, that was the Collett family. Yeah, It'll be a history of it. I'm sorry, reactivated. Sorry. I want to uh, follow up Jeff's final comments there uh, with something I think we're going to kind of run out of time after this next talk uh, but back during um, 1890 and 1891 a gentleman by the name of R.L. Downs wrote an article four articles actually that went into the news topic here and I want to read just a little bit his last words. He was born in 1862 and he had family that were uh, soldiers from Caldwell County. In conclusion, we desire to express the most profound sympathy and love for the defeated heroes of the lost cause. Where is the man in all the South with a single spark of chivalry or of patriotism in his soul? who does not honor them with this sympathy and love and admiration.
How differently are they situated from their northern antagonists, who are today the praised, the petted, the pensioned darlings of this great republic, crowned, as it were, with garlands of victory and honored, it seems, by the whole outside world. But our southern countrymen, actuated by principles as pure and noble and as patriotic, fought as bravely and as faithfully as did their conquering foremen. Yet they are even today stigmatized by a certain element as rebels and traitors. When we think of those things and remember how many of them are today bearing in their bodies the infirmities, the battle scars, the unmistakable signs of suffering from those four years of blood and carnage, we can begin to realize how much is due them at our hands. We cannot love them too well. We cannot honor them too highly. We cannot do too much for them in any way. For their sufferings, their privations, their deals of valor for the country's sake are to us a heritage of honor more precious than the untold material wealth of our mountains and valleys. And those, those words ring true today uh, as we see what's happening around here. Randall is going to come up and talk uh, probably what will be our last talk today. Uh, this is about the reactivated 26th North Carolina, which Jeff Stepp started in the uh, late fall of 1981 and to where we are today, 34 years later. Hard to believe, but uh, the pride of the old North State, no doubt. When did you get in, Skip? 83. 83. I had the privilege of coming in in 88, as was mentioned earlier, and uh, it's... Uh, it's a difficult thing to try to explain to people uh, what being in this regiment is all about unless you're actually there. Um, there's so many other kinds of things that detract from the power of what having been in the 26th is all about. Um, we are, I believe, the largest single reenacting unit in the country uh, as far as one entity. Now there are other other entities that have like an umbrella group that'll have a little group, little group, little group, little group, little group, little group. Little group. We got a big one, uh, and of course we're just, we're divided into a society, people who are not necessarily uh, willing or equipped or just don't have that desire to participate in the military side. Um, we have a, a ladies' aid society, the SBS. Soldiers Benevolent Society and other civilians. Fairly large entity inside of our group, but they're all 26. And then we have the military side, which right now is running uh, 200 and something military members. So you add everybody up, you're well over 300 people, which in the reenacting world is large indeed. A lot of units will come in with 18, 20, maybe 30, maybe a little bit larger. Um, we're quite often the largest elephant on the field, uh, maybe the only elephant on the field when it comes to going to reenactments. Um, when I first got in, I was really excited about the military side, but since then the historical side has taken over as far as all of the, the kinds of, of ways you can go and study this war. Um, in our day and age currently, Obviously, a lot of anything that has the word Confederate in it is under attack, much more so than ever since Reconstruction. Um, we are, we are a, a, a unit that is history first, remembering first, thinking about the qualities of these people who went before us, thinking about their lives that were absolutely destroyed in that, those generations that were in that time period, and yet the survivors coming on through. Um, we have managed to do, and I have managed to have the opportunity to do, so much with this regiment that I could have only dreamed about in my wildest dreams before I got in in 1988. Just learning the drill became almost harder than my master's degree in college. I mean, just absolute truth pouring through this stuff when I made the decision being prodded in that direction by someone in this room who shall remain nameless. But um, studying to be an officer 
And then what that means in the 26th, I was scared to death. Still am from time to time, but usually adrenaline takes, go, takes over and it's okay. But learning the nuances, learning what it takes to maneuver 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 150 men in a battle, and knowing that back in that time period, you're talking about men who might have had to maneuver thousands instead of hundreds, and still trying to get them into the, a good spot and what it feels like and looks like a little tiny bit about what that war was all about for those people who experienced it. And uh, we get, I get so many derogatory remarks, not necessarily pointed at me, but just sort of silly stuff, you know? Well, how do you know when somebody's dead? Well, we figured that out to a pretty good art. And, and we figure it out to the point where we get something out of it we do the historical background on it. We try to make what happens look realistic. And then it brings it home to us. But in being involved in this regiment and being involved in what other regiments like ours does, and by the way, I don't really think there's another one like ours anywhere on the planet, but you know, I had to say that anyway. But you've got, you've got so many things that pull people in. I still get a thrill putting on the uniform after all of these years and being able to walk around in that uniform puts me back in the footsteps a little bit of my ancestors and that's not the only reason but it's a it's a big reason for a lot of the people who are involved in this but it's also remembering what those people sacrificed and what they went through north south what that was all about um, as a regiment, we have been historically active. We have produced this magazine back here for a long time, The Company Front. It is centered primarily on North Carolina primary documentation, and that's important because the war is full of all kinds of mythology. It's all over the place. There's lots of things that people say even today that are just absolutely wrong. They don't know. Um, and the only way to really know, I think, is to have an opportunity to do some of the things that we've had a chance to do, that I've had a chance to do. I get a chance to take tour groups to battlefields. I could not have done that without the 26th because starting as a private and moving up, I got a chance to see the ground and walk on the ground and sleep on the ground and learn the tactics and learn what the, the, the timing would have been and what landscapes look like and what Features on the land would have had something to do with the battle. And all of a sudden, stuff starts to make sense. I think I've got a perspective that no other tour guide has because I've been involved with the 26th as a reenactor for many, many, many years. And I can go out there and I look at it first with this eye of a, of a reenactor. You know, what, what are we seeing here? And it, it, it makes sense. We've had a chance to sleep on the ground at lots and lots of historical places. State sites being right on the ground, federal sites. We pretty much have an open door policy for us at just about anywhere we want to go, to go to a park like Gettysburg and sleep on the ground and wake up about five in the morning and walk out in the field that's covered with, with fog and mist, but you're standing on the ground at Gettysburg. And all of the carnage that happened there and all of the the history making that happened at these places or go to places like Cold Harbor, Sharpsburg, Chancellorsville, and there'll be other places. We recently came off of Appomattox where we led the Confederates in for a four day period of time to surrender. Very strange event. Nevertheless, very much an honor for us as an opportunity to be there and to see if we can do things right. And, and that comment right there, do things right, that means a lot to me in this day and age. Um, you know, the flag controversy is a huge thing. I don't know what you think. I can only tell you what I think. And over the years, I've come to the conclusion that the battle flag is a sacred thing. It never touches the ground back during the war period of time. The only time it should come out today is when it's for history and a sacred thing to look at the honor of the people. And that's, you know, 
it's got a meaning way beyond anything you're going to see inside of all the media mess that's been out there. Um, if those soldiers 150 years ago held it in such esteem that they're not going to let it touch the ground, that's kind of the attitude I think I want to have today is that it belongs in that one place over a battle line and you take care of it. Um, we have a great, a very strong connection to the North Carolina History Museum where we have had an opportunity through raising funds and our connection with them to put in, to play, and then back into history's hands. Eight, working on number nine, and that's putting where your, your actions where your mouth might be. We've, we've preserved for another hundred years or so. Who knows? But at least that long. Eight battle flags or standards for the public to be able to see. And right now we have such a connection with them that the public will be able to see them. It's there. Um, over the years, a number of monuments have gone up. Um, the redoing of the North Carolina Monument at Gettysburg, which is the best monument on the battlefield, uh, done by Gutzon Borglum of Mount Rushmore fame, but still a massive work of art. Redoing it, the placing of two Confederate markers, monuments, that represent the 26th North Carolina on the first day and the third day in size. And I'm sure Jeff can tell you with many hours of explanation how hard it was to do that. You know the federal government and all. Putting another monument, which would be the, the a brother monument to the other two, although larger, at New Bern. They're all of the same design, only different size, to represent the number of troops still or in the regiment at that time period. Big monument at New Bern. Smaller on McPherson's Ridge, smaller still at the high water mark the third day's assault. Um, recently having come off of a massive project to restore and bring to future generations again the Vance Monument at Pack Square in Asheville. Um, what am I missing? Uniform pieces. Yeah, uniform pieces. Letters. <laughs> this, this is what our charge seems to be, to me, to touch it ourselves in the right way, to understand as much as we can, which is limited, of what they went through, what they wore, what their equipment was, how they felt about each other, how they got along with each other, what their battles were like, all that stuff. That's kind of personal. And then on a larger scale, to remember for more people than just us, what these men did, what those generations sacrificed, and putting, what was it, 225,000? We're over 225,000 graves since 2000. Now that's not all us, but that's a lot of us. And uh, my wife, I think, sometimes still thinks I go out in the woods and play cowboys and Indians. She doesn't really now, but I, I can tell you 20 years ago she did. But she's finally kind of come around to understand this is a massive thing in everybody's lives who are touched by the 26th. Massive thing. Here's some of the flags that we've restored. That's the first. Yep. Spotsylvania. 16th, 22nd, which was Company A, Colorado yep. Bulls. 26th was our very first one when we restored. 33rd state flag, we did that last year. 47th North Carolina, and 52nd North Carolina, and then finally the 58th North Carolina, the remnants of actually two flags yeah. that Harper family gave. But those are the flags we are now on uh, Lawrence of Bone Branches. LOB Branches. And there's the new bird. If you are interested in the 26th on any level, there is a place for you. It's not just, you know, very narrow in the military side. It's more than just that. Always has been. And if you'd like to talk to me more about that, I've got a
card I'll give to you. There's places you can contact. Uh, 26nc.org. That's very easy. You can go to our website. You can see what's going on. You can request stuff. You request something, it'll come back to me. So, you know, we, we can talk about things. If you know anybody, and this is, this is a little bit of a sexist remark, but I'm going to say it anyway. In our modern age where we live in separation from each other so much, for me as a male in the 21st century, being part of this group has made a, a huge difference in my life in a lot of different ways. If nothing else, you sit around a campfire and you talk to people and you get away from the technology, you get away from the TV, you get outside and you get a chance to talk to people who are all knowledgeable about a lot of things. And you learn stuff. But if you're interested, please look into us. We're more than just what you might think. Thank you very much. I'm Bill Tate with Caldwell County Now and Then, and I am pleased to announce that we are joining hands with our local Caldwell Heritage Museum in a joint effort to further enhance our history for Caldwell County. I'm proud to announce too that I'm now a board member and it's great to be joining our museum. Uh, Caldwell History Museum could not be more proud to have uh, Mr. Bill Tate here on board. <laughs> it's, uh, it's fantastic to um, enjoy the presence of another man who's just as passionate about Caldwell County if not more so and its history and such a wonderful history and uh, we are glad to have you sir. Thank you and in addition to what we've said here I'd like to uh, say that Caldwell County now and then does not accept donations and if you like the work we do please donate to our museum and what's that address Colin do you remember? Absolutely um, uh, 112 Baden Street Lenore North Carolina.